have lots of refreshments for you, so we want to make sure that you have a chance to get up and stretch your legs, have some refreshments, please help yourself. Um, and first of all, on behalf of the Natural Resources Commission, I want to welcome you to, the, to tonight's Pollinator Garden Program. My name is Stephanie Hawkinson. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the NRC. And on behalf of our board, who many of our board members are here, we have Raina McManus, Katie Griffith, and checking you in was Lisa Olney. We really want to thank you for coming to this workshop. We are so excited to pollinate, or to partner with you. We <laughs> I wore my shirt. We're very excited to pollinate and partner with the New England Wildflower Society to host the first of 12 pollinator garden installations and lectures that will take place across New England. We are the first, so we're all guinea pigs tonight. And we had a workshop this afternoon that was fabulous. We think this lecture is going to be awesome. Tonight's program is made possible by a grant we received from Pollinate New England, which is a new initiative from Noose that raises awareness about the decline of birds, bees, and other pollinators. That insects that pollinate our plants and crops and encourages us to use native plants in our gardens to help create habitats for these critical species. As this effort is closely aligned with the NRC's Grow Green Wellesley initiative, which was launched last year with our Landscapes for Living event, and some of you may have attended that event, which promotes earth-friendly um, and pollinator-friendly landscaping and lawn techniques, we are thrilled to be a recipient of this grant this year. We hope it will be a springboard for our long-term goal of creating a pollinator corridor in Wellesley. The NRC continually works to enhance our town's open space areas. Currently, we are looking for some volunteers to help with our Fullerbrook Park stewardship program. Many of you know Fullerbrook Park. Hopefully, you enjoy Fullerbrook Park. If you are interested in volunteering to help with our stewardship program or any other projects with the NRC, please let us know tonight, or you can contact us at the office, or let, you, let us know when you receive our online newsletter. And tonight we have to say we owe tremendous thanks to our town partners in our Pollinator Garden Project, the Wellesley Police Department and Chief Jack Polecki, and his staff for hosting the garden itself and tonight's lecture, and the Wellesley Department of Public Works, and our landscape extraordinaires, Cricket Blass and Susie Jordan, I hope all of you know them, who will be maintaining and help to develop and plan this particular garden, along with everything else those two do to help make Wellesley a beautiful community. And now to our program. So I was fortunate to watch our presenters this afternoon in action in our workshop. And I hope you saw the pollinator garden as you walked in. We'll go back and take a look at it. But we're all into it for a treat tonight as they share their expertise and knowledge. So a little bit about them. Annie White is an ecological landscape designer specializing in pollinator-friendly landscapes. She is the owner and principal designer of Nectar Landscape Design Studio in Burlington, Vermont. And she's an adjunct professor at the University of Vermont. Annie holds a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD in plant and soil science from the University of Vermont. Her partner in crime, New England Wildflower Society, <laughs> Society's Botanic Garden Director, Mark Richardson, studied ornamental horticulture at the University of Rhode Island and holds a master's degree from the University of Delaware's Longwood Graduate Program. In his roles as Botanic Garden Director, he oversees the Society's 45-acre botanic garden, Garden in the Woods, and the Nasami Farm Native Plant Nursery, of which all of our plants in the garden came from today. Mark is also the co-author of the book, Native Plants for New England Gardens, which is on sale tonight. So please join me in welcoming Annie and Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, first, uh, I just want to say we had a great time this afternoon installing the poll pollinator garden. Um, and we will be wandering out there. We're going to have a short break in between my talk and Annie's talk. Um, but real quickly, I'm going to say a few words about the Wildflower Society and then a invite Annie to come up and speak. And then I'll finish out afterwards. So there will be a break in between the second switch. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, we had a great time this afternoon, so thank you um, to everyone who participated, who came for the workshop. Uh, this was, you know, you, you guys were really our guinea pigs, so we really appreciate everything that you did to make it go off swimmingly. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, introduce you to the Wildflower Society, talk a little bit about the Pollinate New England program specifically, um, and then uh, I'll invite Annie to come up and give her part of the presentation, and then um, I'll finish out a little bit later. So. Basically, the way this is going to work is she's going to talk about landscape design and probably a little bit more insects, and I'm going to talk about more plants. Um, so, you know, her expertise, my expertise, um, we're, we've kind of structured it that way. 
Um, so anyway, the uh, New England Wildflower Society is the nation's oldest plant conservation organization. We were founded around 1900 um, by really by a group of uh, um, essentially garden club women who were very concerned about the plight of our uh, native wildflowers. Um, at the time, a lot of wildflowers were being harvested directly from the from the forest in and around Boston, um, and so the Wildflower Society was really formed as the I think it was the Native, uh, Plant, uh, Native Plant Preservation Society of New England. Um, we've gone through a number of different name changes throughout the course of our history, um, but it was really founded to try to do something about that. Uh, so it was you know, tasked with outreach and education, uh, putting up signs like the one that you see here, you know, spare the flowers, pick only what you need, um, don't dig things up, uh, and really trying to educate people about how to grow some of the great uh, native wildflowers we have in our area in their own garden so they wouldn't harvest them directly from the wild. Um, we have a, a mission statement that was adopted in 2010 by our board. Uh, and so this is our sort of current approach to wildflower preservation and, and it's to conserve and promote the region's native plants to ensure healthy, biologically diverse landscapes. Um, so we really are committed to you know, teaching people, inspiring people, and doing uh, practical conservation work on the ground. And we do this in a number of different ways. Uh, first, we try to inspire people to use native plants in their own gardens um, through programs like this one and through visits to Garden in the Woods, um, through plant sales of you know, some really fantastic native New England plants uh, at both Nasami Farm and Garden in the Woods. Um, we, uh, here's an image of Nasami. Nasami is, uh, I, how many of you have visited Nasami Farm? Just uh, a couple people, that's great. So it's about two hours west of here, and it's where we do most of our propagation work. And uh, in my part of the presentation later, I'll talk a little bit more about the propagation work that we do. Uh, but this is where we grow most of the plants that we sell to the public, uh, that we offer for ecological restoration projects, uh, that we offer for landscape design projects, and that we install at Garden in the Woods. Um, Nasami essentially grows maybe 10 to 50,000 um, perennial plugs for Garden in the Woods every single year, depending on the project load. Uh, and they grow you know, thousands of plugs each year for sale as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, we also uh, try to be a, a great resource um, for people to you know, find information about native plants. We do this in a number of different ways. We uh, rewrote the Flora of New England. That's the, the book on the left. It's all in Latin. Um, like every good botanist, Arthur Haynes speaks only in Latin. So uh, he, he, he gave the title of the book uh, a Latin name as well. Flora Nova Angliae just means the Flora of New England. Uh, that was published in 2011. Um, books like the one that my colleague Dan Jaffe and I wrote and the, uh, the book that Ted Elman wrote um, just a few years ago called Wildflowers of New England, which is a four-color guide to about 1,200 or so wildflowers that you'll find throughout the region. We, uh, we also are the region's seed bank. Uh, so what this means is we know where all the rare and endangered plant populations are, and we visit them regularly with a team of plant conservation volunteers. Uh, we have about 1,200 volunteers who've been trained throughout uh, the course of the you know, 25 or 30 years that we've been running this program. Uh, and we, so we work in conjunction with all the natural heritage agencies in each state in New England to uh, monitor those rare plant populations, collect seed off of them uh, as appropriate, and then store that seed in a, in a you know, really high security vault um, at Garden in the Woods that's essentially just a big chest freezer. Uh, uh, where all the seed for rare plants all throughout the region um, are kept. Um, so we work with a, a lot of volunteers um, and uh, a lot of people throughout the region on conserving, um, conserving native plants. Um, what we're perhaps best known for is Garden in the Woods, which is our 45-acre botanic garden. Uh, it was founded by a gentleman named Will Curtis, who, who bought the property in 1931. Um, this is not a talk about Garden in the Woods, but I do want to mention it because it's where I spend most of my time. Um, the garden uh, was, was developed by Will and his partner Dick Stiles over the course of about 30 years. Uh, he made his home there, um, uh, grew a ton of plants there. We've sort of upheld his tradition of, of plant propagation. And after about you know, 30 or almost 40 years of, of gardening and, and really developing a beautiful naturalistic display garden, um, he decided uh, that he would give the garden to the Wildflower Society. Um, so in 1965, he essentially handed the keys of the castle over to us. Um, and so that's the, you know, sometimes I think the difficult relationship or difficult understanding that people have of our relationship with Garden in the Woods. 
New England Wildflower Society is the organization that owns Garden in the Woods. We operate and run Garden in the Woods, uh, but we are, you know, New England Wildflower Society. Uh, and it's our, our crown jewel. We really love uh, having Garden in the Woods. Uh, and that uh, ends my sort of introduction um, to the Wildflower Society. And so at this point, what I'd like to do is invite Annie to come up um, and begin her portion of the presentation. Oh, quickly before I do that, because I forgot to mention this, um, uh, Poly New England is our six state uh, outreach um, program that was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, Pollinate New England involves an online course, uh, 12 hands-on workshops like the one that we held here today um, and we'll be doing throughout the summer. Um, and uh, and uh, a lot of resources um, for people to really get in, gain an understanding for how they can best support pollinators in their home gardens. Uh, we like to tell people that you know a single plant can be habitat for a pollinator. Uh, if you're growing a plant like milkweed, for example, it's a it's a, uh, the habitat for the monarch caterpillar. Uh, and so you know doing a, a small part on the landscape to support pollinators. Uh, is really important and so the, the overall crux of the program is to encourage people to plant, you know, carve out a small niche within their own home gardens uh, and home landscapes to, uh, you know, provide some habitat for pollinators um, and also to, you know, show people how to do it um, through the online course and through the, the hands-on <coughs> workshops. We have about 15 people at the workshop this, uh, this afternoon uh, and our hope is that those 15 people uh, you know, have a good experience, go home and um, uh, build their own pollinator garden in their backyard uh, and that we can you know, develop a huge network of pollinator gardens through, uh, through this program. So that's the point um, of what, what it is we're trying to do and at this point I'll turn it over to you. Thank you all. Um, starting off, I want to do some thank yous as well. Um, Stephanie was up here rattling off a bunch of thank yous, but I want to thank Stephanie Hawkinson um, for all of the work that she's done um, making this workshop happen. Um, also want to thank again uh, Cricket Blass and Susie, Susie Jordan um, who have also been involved and um, are doing great things like what Stephanie said to make Wellesley more beautiful. Um, and of course, thanking the Wellesley Police Department for hosting our garden and hosting our um, entire workshop today. So thank you to everyone. So I'm going to start off in my talk uh, talking about the importance of pollinators. I'm going to talk a bit about concerns related to pollinator health and what we can do as gardeners, sort of our role in restoring habitat for pollinators. And I'm then going to walk you through some pretty straightforward tips on just how to create a more pollinator friendly landscape. Um, and then afterwards I'll, I'll let Mark go into the details about actual plant selection. So I sometimes give entire lectures just about the importance of pollinators. So I've um, condensed an entire lecture just down into one slide <laughs> of what I think are some of the kind of the really key <coughs> statistics to highlight. 75%, that's the percentage of the world's food crops that depend at least in part on insect pollination. 90%, that's the percentage of wildflowering plants that depend on animal-mediated pollination. And the value of pollination services is really um, <coughs> astronomical. It's estimated to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars annually, um, globally. That's the sort of the value um, that we place on pollinators. And then one statistic that I don't hear talked about uh, very often is the increase in agricultural production um, over the last 50 years. We've seen a 300% increase in the volume of agricultural production that's dependent on insect pollination. So during this period of time where we've seen pollinators begin to struggle more and more, we're seeing honeybee colonies um, struggling with diseases and pesticide exposure, um, we've also seen this huge increase in the need for their services in our agricultural systems. And then that has led to a real mismatch between the demand for pollinators and the supply for pollinators. And a recent study um, out of the University of Vermont estimated that 39% of the pollinator dependent crop area in the U.S. suffers from a mismatch between the, um, the supply of wild bees for pollination services and the demand for them. So taking sort of a step back, 
Um, wanted to make sure that we all understand just the very basics of what pollination is. So insect pollination 101, put in the very simplest of terms, um, pollinators help to move pollen from the male parts of the flower, flower to the female parts of the flower, enabling the plant to reproduce. So plants are stationary, right? They're putting the roots down in the ground. They don't have any way to uh, find their mates out in the landscape. So they're relying on pollination. Um, some plants are wind pollinated, but 90% of our flowering plants are relying on some form of, of animal mediated pollination, most of the time by insects, and of insects most of the time by bees. So here we see a bee. Um, again, majority of pollinating animals are insects, and bees are the most important group for most plants. But there are other pollinators that are out there that we still love to see and that often provide very special niches. Um, of course, butterflies and moths. Hummingbirds are also pollinators. Um, flies are um, surprisingly important, actually, behind bees. They are the next um, si most significant group in agricultural pollination. Uh, beetles, wasps, and ants are also, to a smaller degree, um, serving as pollinators in our landscapes. So why are bees so important? Well, they have just evolved <coughs> alongside flowers over thousands and thousands of years, and they are, have really evolved to be excellent pollinators. They deliberately gather pollen from the flower, which is not true of other pollinators. Some other pollinators, like butterflies, are just trying to go after the nectar in the flower. Um, whereas bees do collect pollen and they use that pollen as a food source for their young. They also um, they exhibit what we call flower constancy, meaning they tend to stay very loyal to a single plant species while they're foraging. And that just increases the likelihood that they're going to move the pollen of one plant um, to another plant of the same species. They're not going to be mix and matching. And just look at their bodies. Their bodies are covered with hair. Um, the hairs are branched to be even extra sticky, and this is different than wasps, which do not have hairy bodies and are not as effective as pollinators. And furthermore, a lot of the female bees have actually evolved special, special structures on their hind legs for carrying pollen. So they'll collect pollen, they'll mix it up with a little bit of nectar and create these little wads. You may have seen bees with these on their legs. Um, we call that bee bread sometimes. Um, and they'll take those back to their nests and that bee bread is what their larvae are going to feed on when they first hatch. When most people think about pollinators and think about bees, they often think of a scene like this. Um, here are honeybees, a managed colony of honeybees in one of our Vermont apple orchards. And this is a really typical scene in agricultural settings. Um, honeybees are not native. They did not um, historically exist here. They have been here for hundreds of years. They were um, introduced and have been managed. And they are very, very important for agricultural production but they are a single species. And we do rely on honeybees for a lot of our agricultural pollination again. And I mentioned some crops are wind pollinated. So our major crops like corn and wheat are wind pollinated. Um, but if you look at all of the nutrition in our diet, um, the flavor in our diets, a lot of those, almost all of them, are insect pollinated. So melons, cucurbits, apples, blueberries, um, cranberries, a huge crop here in Massachusetts um, that absolutely 100% need insect pollination. Um, and then almonds. I'm showing almonds up here. Out in California, there's over a million acres of almond groves now, um, and they 100% rely on bee pollination. And then a couple that I didn't show, but that I, I personally are very close to my heart, um, coffee and chocolate, <laughs> greatly enhanced by, uh, their production is enhanced by insect pollinations. So the, sort of the system that we have now um, involves actually transporting honeybee hives all over the country to the locations where they're needed. So if you think about the way that we practice agriculture, particularly the almond groves out in California, um, a million acres 
almost zero natural habitat left for any of our native bees to exist. It's a single crop, it has a short bloom period, and they just need a whole bunch of pollinators in there for a pretty short amount of time. And so they truck pollinators on the back of semi-trucks um, out to California. There was even one year where they flew them in from Australia when there was a shortage, and then that turned out to obviously be a very bad idea. A lot of us probably could have predicted that. There were some disease problems there. But they do on the East Coast. Um, a lot of bees spend their winters down in Florida in the orange groves and get trucked up to the coast of Maine with the blueberry fields in the summer. Um, and even into the cranberry bogs here in Massachusetts. So, so that's kind of the system that we're looking at. And as many of us have heard, um, there have been some really worrying um, struggles with honeybee colonies. And we've seen some um, really high winter losses as well as summer losses in bee colonies. Um, this chart was put together by um, a nonprofit called Bee Informed. And this includes preliminary data for 2017 and 2018. So um, looking at this bar chart in gray is the, what's considered to be an acceptable winter loss of honeybee colonies. Um, in yellow, that's the total winter loss for each of these years. Um, and then the total annual loss. So you can just see that um, a really strong trend here over the last decade of having um, significantly higher losses in honeybee colonies than what is considered acceptable. And so a lot of scientists are trying to figure out why um, we're seeing these losses. And I'll talk in a minute about those stressors. So all of what I've said, I think, really should make us think uh, much more about our native pollinators and how we can um, invest more in trying to encourage healthy native pollinator populations, because this is our insurance policy against the honeybee. We're putting so much, you know, billions of dollars of value of agricultural crop in a single pollinator species. But yet we have 200 species of native pollinators that are just out in our landscapes, just living there. In many cases, a lot of these pollinators are actually more efficient and more effective at pollinating some of our crops, um, like apples and blueberries, um, cranberries as well, are more efficiently pollinated by native bees than honeybees. And so this is just a sort of a fun poster to put up that's showing a diversity of different bees. Um, and this isn't even nearly all of them, but sort of a, a cross section of them. Um, so really cool things like green sweat bees. Um, that's one of my favorites. Uh, orchard bees is another fun one. Oh, um, um, and this is fun, it just shows the contrast between um, our largest native bee, which are carpenter bees. Um, how many of you have brought maybe one native bee that we don't all love so much? Um, they are our largest native bee, and then uh, we have a huge diversity of like really tiny, small, dark native bees um, that often get overlooked, but a lot of them are, are great at pollinating certain flowers. So there have been documented declines as well in our native mm. pollinator populations. Um, and we believe both with honeybees and with our native pollinators that there are multiple stressors that are acting on them and acting in concert. And um, a lot of these stressors have been studied. There's a lot of research going into pesticides right now and their impact. But it's probably in many landscapes, all of these acting together. It's habitat loss and fragmentation, a lot of parasites and diseases, um, the prevalence of pesticides, as well as the use of fertilizers, which have really changed the way that we farm uh, much more intensively. Um, also, um, invasion of invasive plant species that are displacing our native plant species. And um, climate change is one that we're um, starting to learn more and more about and how Climate change may change the phenology of flowers when they bloom, um, which will have an impact on pollinators that base their life cycle off of when different flowers bloom. So, but I want to focus in on habitat loss in particular because of all of those stressors, um, some scientists believe that habitat loss is the most significant, particularly for our wild native bees. And there's been research that has shown that 
um, habitat loss negatively affects the abundance and the species richness of wild bees. And here's a shot of one of those almond groves out in California. So really no natural habitat whatsoever left over for our native bee populations to live. And they, it's so important for our native bees to have that natural habitat because they don't live in wooden boxes that we build. They live out in the landscape. But the good news in all of this is that more and more studies are showing that pollinator habitat restoration works. That by preserving or by restoring pollinator habitat that we can improve the abundance of bees, um, the species richness, and the productivity. Even in landscapes that have very little natural habitat, so even in urban areas, doing something as small as um, putting a pollinator garden out in front of the Wellesley Police Station uh, <laughs> can have a really positive impact uh, locally on uh, bee abundance. And, um, and I guarantee that we'll see that right here with what we've put in today. So what we're challenged with, um, what I sort of work to do every single day, um, and what I encourage you all to do in your own landscapes, is to try to find ways to incorporate more floral resources, and remembering that those floral resources, that's the food source for pollinators. So their food is the nectar, and sometimes the pollen that's produced by the plants. So they need those flowering resources, they need those flowering resources throughout the entire season. Um, and they need nesting sites. Um, many of our native pollinators are either ground nesting, they're nesting in the ground, or they're nesting in um, cavities that they find, um, hollowed out stems, um, woody locations. And they also need protection from these various stressors that we're putting on them. Protection from pesticides is probably the biggest. And so if we look at what this kind of typical um, suburban landscape may look like now that we're sort of challenged with um, these very um, intensive agricultural systems with no natural habitat, and then also urban sprawl where we've, we have a huge amount of lawn that has almost zero habitat value to it, a lot of non-native species that we're putting in as landscaping plants, um, and we're really not providing the habitat that pollinators need to. Um, complete their life cycles. But that's what we're here to teach um, you how to better do, how you can incorporate um, better practices to encourage pollinator habitat into your own backyards, um, into schoolyards, uh, other municipal locations, parks, um, or even just on a few container plants on your back patio can make a difference. Okay, what to grow for pollinators. Um, I'm mostly going to leave that um, up to Mark to talk about tonight, but I did want to point out that there are a lot of plant lists out there in the last few years, I think, with a growing interest in planting for pollinators. It seems like everybody's been um, trying to jump on the bandwagon and put a, um, a list out there. I would approach many of the lists with a little bit of caution. I found that a lot of these lists are based on other lists that seem to be based on other lists. That <laughs> I sort of cringe at some of the lists that have been coming out, but um, um, certainly we're going to talk about some resources tonight that I think are really good, um, tried and true. But with some of these lists, I also encourage people to observe what's going on in your own gardens. Um, observe what you see in the landscape, observe what's going on in your own gardens. If you're seeing a lot of diversity of pollinators, and a lot of pollinators, high abundance on some of your plants, that probably means it's a great plant, even if it's not on one of these lists. Okay, so I'm going to run through, um, I think I've got 16 design tips tonight. Um, first one is to plant a variety of flower shapes and sizes. So one thing that I um, was really kind of amazed to see in the research that I've done, um, and I should mention that for uh, my PhD work at the University of Vermont, my research was all based on evaluating native plant species for pollinators and comparing um, native plant species to cultivated varieties of native species or native cultivars. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But um, So I've spent a lot of time just observing pollinators and their interactions with various plants. And one thing that I was really surprised to see is how 
how different pollinators have very different preferences for different flower types. And it really comes down to the morphology of the flower and the morphology of that pollinator. Um, so a few examples, um, like Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot, that is primarily pollinated by long-tongued bumblebees, specifically, <laughs> uh, because they have very long corolla tubes. Um, that corolla tube, sort of the, the world part of the flower, um, is very difficult to get down inside unless you have a very long tongue. <laughs> um, and some plants, this is not a native to New England, but native to the Midwest, uh, but very commonly planted purple comb flower or echinaceas, um, are a real favorite of, of butterflies because they love to land on composite flowers um, or daisy-like flowers and sort of sit there and rest, and they can suck the nectar out of each one of those little, um, little flowers. Um, you'll see a lot more of our small native bees on things like Rebecca. Um, Baptisia is pollinated again by bumblebees that are strong enough to work their way into the flower. Um, uh, this is another fun one, Penstemon digitalis. It has a very hairy staminoid in the center of the flower. Um, and it's difficult for larger bees um, to sort of wiggle around that, that hairy um, and a little bit sticky staminoid. Um, so that's mostly pollinated again by some of our smaller native bees. So if you want to really um, attract a diversity of pollinators, plant a diversity of plants. And that's also a weakness of a lot of the lists out there, is that if you're planting for honeybees, it's going to be a very different list than if you're planting for bumblebees, um, or if you want to plant for butterflies. Um, they all have different preferences. Um, sometimes people refer to um, preferences of different pollinator types as pollinator syndromes. Uh, this is a neat um, chart that was put together by pollinator.org, um, expressing the different preferences by different types of pollinators um, and attributes of, of the plant. So uh, one of these that might be fun to look at. So looking at flies, um, they prefer flowers that are pale or dark brown or purple. They don't pay attention, attention to nectar guides. Um, they prefer putrid odors. <laughs> um, they're not so concerned with nectar. Um, that unlimited, limited, limited, and uh, limited pollen, and the types of flowers. So, I encourage you, to, if you're interested in this, to um, look up pollinator syndromes and learn more about them. Okay, uh, making sure that you, when you're putting together a, a garden or even within your landscape, that you have plants with a diversity of bloom times. Um, think of your landscape as a buffet for pollinators, and you don't want to leave them. Um, high and dry during a few weeks in the summer. If you're going to um, have attractive plants, you won't need to have something in bloom throughout the entire year. And you're not going to get that from a single plant species. You're going to get it from looking at when each of these species is blooming and sort of uh, make sure that you have something blooming. A general rule of thumb is trying to have at least three different uh, species in your landscape blooming at the same time. This is where also um, trees and shrubs can become very, very important because early in the season, um, that's when resources are very limited and we have some really wonderful early spring flowering trees and shrubs. And late in the season is very um, important as well. Um, color is important for pollinators. It's one of the first visual cues that they use to be attracted to a plant or even attracted into a garden in general. Um, bees tend to be attracted more to flowers that are purple or yellow or white. Um, they have a very hard time distinguishing between red and green. Um, and that's because bees see in a different color spectrum than we see in. They see in an ultraviolet light um, spectrum. So they have very um, high sensitivity to the purples, the yellows, the whites, very low sensitivity to reds. Um, and if you notice, a lot of our red flowers tend to be hummingbird pollinated, like this cardinal flower here, um, or even um, butterfly pollinated sometimes. Um, color patterns in a plant can also form nectar guides. Um, I think this is just really fascinating. I never really paid attention to nectar guides in a flower before I started being interested in pollinators. 
Um, these beautiful patterns are not just for our own enjoyment. Um, they do serve a function of attracting pollinators and helping to guide them down to the reproductive parts of the plant, um, like this beautiful um, iris versicolor here. And what I find even more fascinating is to think about how different plants are um, seen and perceived differently by bees than they are to us. So a marsh marigold under um, just our visible light spectrum appears to be this monochromatic, not so interesting yellow flower. Uh, but if you photograph using that, um, photograph the plant using a simulated bee vision, so what this might look like to a bee in the ultraviolet spectrum, um, you can see um, nectar guides on the plant, um, a little bit of color variation, and the pollen is actually kind of um, radiating this uh, really bright, uh, brilliant color. And there was um, just this spring in National Geographic, they did um, a spread on these photographs that were taken by Greg Burroughs, um, and he developed a technique called ultraviolet induced visible fluorescence photography. Um, and the images are just amazing. This is um, Plains Coreopsis, um, a Midwest native plant. Um, again, one that's really not too extravagant in visible light. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, you can even see the difference between a plant that's not in kind of full bloom. It hasn't started to produce the pollen versus one that has. Um, mm -hmm. So I encourage you to check out his work because yeah. the, the yeah. series of photographs are really incredible. Um, in general, this doesn't just pertain to native plants, it pertains to sort of all plants out in the landscape, but uh, in recent decades, we have had an obsession in the horticulture industry of doubling everything that we can get our hands on. We've doubled our marigolds, our roses, our zinnias, um, all kinds of annuals and perennials. Um, doubling a flower is a genetic mutation within the plant. It is modifying um, the uh, the stamens into additional petals, and so it makes the plant um, less fertile. It's not producing as much nectar and pollen. Sometimes they're entirely sterile, um, and the little pollen and nectar that they do produce, it becomes uh, much more difficult for pollinators to access, like this poor bee here trying to work its way into a double zinnia. Mm. So try to, um, to stay with a simple open forms of flowers when given the choice. Of course, what we're here really to promote today, and what we'll talk a lot more about throughout the evening, is encouraging the use of more native plants in the landscape. Uh, research has shown that pollinators prefer native plants over non-native plants and introduced plants. Um, not exclusively, so there are exceptions to this. We do have some introduced plants that are attractive. We even have some really terrible um, invasive plants that are attractive to some species. Um, but on a whole, encouraging more native plants is um, the best way to benefit more pollinators. And then there's a whole myriad of other reasons why you want to use more native plants in your landscape as well. Um, based on um, Dr. Doug Tallamy's work out of the University of Delaware and all of his studies of suburban landscapes, um, he found that only about 20 to 30 percent of the plants put into suburban landscapes are native species. So that means the vast majority of what's being planted um, are non-native species. Um, and so I think um, really trying to change that trend of getting us to, instead of planting predominantly non-native species, planting predominantly native species is going to have a huge impact on pollinators as well as other wildlife and the sustainability of the landscapes. Okay, um, next tip is to be cautious of native cultivars. <coughs> um, consider the advantages and disadvantages when planting them. So this is uh, the topic that I researched um, quite in depth, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about um, what I studied and what I um, concluded. So a native species, a native species is a plant that has, um, that's, that's part of the balance of nature. It's developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. So it's, it's in its original form, basically. It's not been altered by humans. A native cultivar, um, native cultivar means a native cultivated variety. 
It's a variation of that native species that has been deliberately selected by humans, by us. Um, Crossbred, or sometimes we consider hybridized um, natives to be native cultivars, some people don't. Um, and we're choosing these for desirable characteristics that we might enjoy in the plant. It might be a color change, maybe a shorter stature, um, maybe a, um, a different bloom time. And then we maintain those, char those characteristics through propagation. So a simple example of that on the left is our, our true native New England aster, Symphio trichum novi angliae. And there are dozens and dozens of cultivars of New England asters that are out there available. Um, one that I researched is a, one called Amla Pachk, which was popular several years back. Uh, you can see a color change. It also has a shorter stature. So I was really curious, well, do these native cultivars provide the same benefit to pollinators as the native species? And I studied a whole array. <laughs> not going to talk about all of these, but um, kind of a lot of these pairs. We're uh, pairing a native species with a cultivated variety of that native species and see if they're providing the same value to pollinators. And I also studied um, echinaceas, even though they're not native to New England, but because they are so popular in the landscape. Here's our aster example again. Um, unfortunately, I'll try it one more time. This is a video, but it doesn't look like it will play through this projector, which is fine. So here's the um, here's the cultivar. You can see it does have sort of a nicer um, <coughs> uniformity to it. That's a group of, of six plants. Um, if you are watching the video, you would see a pollinator here or there sort of flying in. Um, and this is the native species <laughs> in the same garden, same location. Um, much taller, a little bit more unruly, a bit wilder. Um, if this video were playing, you would see um, hundreds, and I'm not oh. exaggerating, bees, butterflies, moths, just swarming um, this plot. And it was um, a, I don't think I put the, but um, really significant difference between the cultivated varieties. So, um, so that said, I would um, encourage you when you're looking for native plants um, to be really cautious of cultivated varieties. Um, I would always recommend choosing the true native species, so one that doesn't have the little branded, um, fun, sexy name. Um, <laughs> stick with the original form and um, yeah, be aware that there can be some trade-offs when using cultivars. And I wanted to provide another example of this. Um, I also have studied nectar production in plants um, using some really challenging techniques of actually pretending that I'm a bee and going into the landscape with really tiny microcapillary <laughs> tubes and extracting nectar and then analyzing the, uh, measuring the volume of it and the sugar content of it. Um, but I found that actually these techniques of studying nectar worked really well in mobilias because they do produce um, pretty, uh, sub more substantial amounts of nectar. This is a native uh, cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. It is um, hummingbird pollinated. And then its cousin, um, great blue Lobelia or Lobelia syphilitica, is bumblebee pollinated. So these are two native species. But if you go to a garden center, <coughs> Oftentimes what you're going to find, or you're going to find lobelias, they may even still be called cardinal flowers, um, or great blue lobelias, um, but they're oftentimes hybrids that have been developed for certain garden characteristics again. Uh, one that I see a lot is called, um, the, it's part of the fan series, so it would be labeled as lobelia ex speciosa. Um, the fan scarlet is looks much more like the cardinal flower. Fan blue looks more like the um, mobilia. So I was really curious in this kind of spectrum, going from native species to native species with these two hybridized versions in between, um, what their nectar production would look like, especially because um, the two on the ends have different pollinators. One is attracting hummingbirds and one is attracting bumblebees. Um, hummingbird pollinated plants typically have much higher nectar production because the hummingbirds need a lot more um, nectar. So 
this was really interesting to me. This is not what I was expecting exactly to see. So I knew there would be really um, high concentrations of nectar in Lobelia cardinalis and much lower concentrations in um, the great blue Lobelia. I figured maybe these two hybrids would fall somewhere in between, but they actually didn't. They fell um, basically no significant difference between uh, the nectar production in um, just one of their parents. And where this is really concerning is in this example of a Lobelia cardinalis, our native species, compared to what's also marketed as cardinal flower, it's sold as cardinal flower, um, but this is the hybridized version of it, and it only has about 20% of the nectar in each flower as the native species. And so, I don't know if that means that hummingbirds are just going to visit five times as many flowers to get enough nectar, or if they're going to spend so much energy visiting flower after flower because they're attracted to these flowers, they look like they should have good nectar in them, uh, if they're actually expending more energy than they're getting. Um, I think that's sort of one cautionary tale of cultivars. So be cautious of the native cultivars. Um, and when evaluating these, I think a few things that you can do, certainly avoid double flowered varieties, like all of the double, double flowered echinaceas that we have now. Um, be really cautious of the hybrids. Um, if you can't get the native species, we sometimes call them straight species, um, to choose cultivars that are most similar to the straight species. Okay, I have two, two number sixes here. <laughs> Excel in a lot of things, but not not numbering. Um, okay, so also think beyond your flowering plants. Um, I think so often um, we focus on what a plant looks like when it blooms, and for a lot of our pollinators, certainly the bloom is very very important as a food source. But oftentimes for um, pollinators, lepidopterans in particular, so those are moths and butterflies, um, in their larval stages they have specialist relationships with certain native species. So the one example that most of us are probably familiar with is um, monarch caterpillars and their specialist relationship with milkweed. So monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweed species. Um, when those eggs hatch into larvae, the larva can only digest um, the, uh, the plant material of milkweeds. But there are dozens of other examples um, of similar relationships. And so think about including host plants in your, in your landscapes as well as just flowering plants. And there are plenty of plants that flower and provide a host relationship. Um, when choosing flowering plants, ensure that you are um, getting plants that have not been treated with systemic insecticides, such as neonicotinoids. Um, how many of you have heard of neonicotinoids? Almost everybody in the room. So, um, Another thing that the media has covered really well. So um, neonicotinoids, they're a class of systemic insecticide. They're widely, widely used in the greenhouse industry. They're very effective for controlling common greenhouse pests like aphids. Um, but they are an insecticide. Pollinators are insects. Um, they're systemic, meaning that a plant that is treated with this type of insecticide, um, that insecticide um, is absorbed into the tissues of the plant. It can be also moved into the nectar and the pollen of the plant. So pollinators can vi visit these flowers and actually be collecting insecticide from the pollen and nectar. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of research that's going into um, just how bad this really is. Are there certain ways that we can treat plants or how long does it stay in the plant? But I say until we know more, just avoid plants. Um, there's been a lot of um, consumer pressure, which is really great, of, of consumers like you going to greenhouses and saying, you know, are you using systemic insecticides? Um, what can you do to, um, you know, help me here? Some places have agreed to not use them at all. Um, others have agreed to at least label plants that have been treated. Um, one kind of basic landscaping design tip is to minimize your lawn. Um, really think about what purpose your lawn is serving to you and try to convert more of your lawn space into uh, more natural landscapes um, and to maximize your flowering plants within those landscapes. 
So going from this um, kind of a classic landscape to something that's a little bit more naturalistic. Uh, one way that you can do that is to try to invert the relationship between your lawn and your planting beds. I think so many times as landscape designers um, and also as homeowners, we tend to think of our lawn as our blank slate and then we design into that. We sort of plop a garden here, plop a garden there. But really trying to reverse that way of thinking and, and considering your landscape as soil and then and design, be very intentional about your lawn. Um, a lot of us still, we want to have lawn for recreational space. Um, and that's fine, but think about how much you really need and what you can put back into a more habitat-friendly landscape. When you're planting for pollinators, uh, planting in masses, or at least in repetition, can be valuable. Um, I mentioned earlier that a lot of bee pollinators prefer to stay true and loyal to a single species while they're foraging. Um, so you're making it just a little bit easier on them if you're planting in masses. Uh, this is not an entirely native landscape, but I wanted to also point out that this is a very sort of fashionable way of uh, landscape design right now, planting in these large masses. Uh, that's, that's the Lurie Garden in Chicago. So a general rule of thumb I sometimes use is a minimum of five to seven plants um, massed together. Or if you don't want to do massing and you want to do a little bit more of a, a mixed landscape, at least having repetition in your garden. Mm -hmm. Consider the best microclimates for pollinators. Pollinators love gardens that have um, really great southern and eastern sun exposure. Um, the reason for the eastern sun exposure means you're going to get that early morning sun that's going to dry out the flowers, and that's when pollinators will start to forage. They really hate. Seven one zero zero, please, Doctor Hughes. Seven one zero zero. Most bee pollinators really don't want to be out there while the flowers are still wet. Um, good soil drainage is going to be important for your ground nesting pollinators. Um, and also protecting, if possible, the site from prevailing winds. So if you have some kind of a, um, like a hedge or a tree line that is going to uh, give this nice little microclimate to your garden, um, is great. And also, um, sort of obviously, making sure that your site is protected from agricultural sprays and other pesticides, whether you're adjacent to a, a farm or just a neighbor mm -hmm. um, that's using a lot of pesticides. So I mentioned our ground nesting bees. 70% of all our native bees are ground nesting. And these are not um, like the ground nesting hornets or yellow jackets that we all hate and we get stung by. Um, these are just solitary bees. They're uh, really very docile. Um, I love to see them in the spring, early in the spring, some of our native indrenid bees. So encouraging habitat for them, um, sometimes leaving parts of the garden or parts of your landscape that are bare or sparsely vegetated in well-drained soil. They really like um, sort of compacted, sandy, well-drained soil. <laughs> um, minimizing wood mulch. Um, we mulch today in the garden. It's sort of that's one thing where sometimes you just, the benefits of mulching um, in terms of weed suppression and uh, moisture retention sometimes outweigh um, what you might be able to provide for enhance for habitat for ground nesting bees, but um, something to consider when you're applying mulch. So the other 30% of our native bees are cavity nesting. So they're nesting in um, pithy stems of plants that may be in your garden. They love things like raspberries, um, even stems of Joe pie weeds, um, leaving a little bit of a messy landscape like a, a, a brush pile or an old tree snag, leaving that up is gonna provide cavity nesting bee habitat. And then there are also nesting boxes that you can consider. Um, these, I've experimented with them. I haven't had great success. From what I've heard, other people sort of say, um, if you have a lot of natural vegetation in your landscape, the bees are gonna choose the natural vegetation over these boxes that you put up. But, um, <laughs> I think sort of the one benefit of the boxes um, is that they're great conversation starters with your neighbors. <laughs> so I, I keep them up and they're fun and they are cool and they look nice. Um, I've also done some really fun things with, um, with nesting habitat. I 
This is one I made um, out of using almost entirely invasive species too. The hollowed out stems are um, Phragmites and Japanese knotweed, mm -hmm. two invasive species, so now I'm putting them to a good use. Um, and you can go over the top of these bee habitats. This was done at the Woodman Farm at the University of New Hampshire. Um, so, fun activities. And with um, these cavity nesting bees, and in building boxes for them. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but it's pretty neat. Like research has shown that, that different um, cavity nesting bees prefer holes of different widths. So if you are trying to build habitat for them, um, you can you want to drill holes of different diameters, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to provide um, this habitat for different bees. Um, and some of the bees will, um, so they go into these, these um, cavities, they'll lay their larva, they put a little bit of that nectar and pollen bee bread in there for when the larva hatch. Um, sometimes they'll plug the hole with mud. Leaf cutter bees will actually plug the hole um, with leaves. And related to nesting habitat, um, trying to leave your gardens intact through the winter season has a myriad of benefits. I think it's absolutely beautiful, um, particularly in northern landscapes where, uh, let's be honest, we look at our landscapes more like this than we look at them the way they are today. Um, so designing landscapes that are going to look great in all four seasons, that have a lot of texture, color, um, and shades of brown, um, can be beautiful. A lot of our native plants also provide seed for songbirds. And this vegetation um, can also provide nesting habitat for um, a great deal of pollinators. And here's um, a front lawn with a garden that hasn't been cut back. And I think it just it really highlights the different textures, um, the different colors. Uh, brown is a color. You can think of uh, designing a garden with shades of brown. Um, I sort of dream someday of putting together a coffee table book that is just a book all of what plants look like um, in January. <laughs> the way people might consider them to be dead plants, but uh, I think they can be cool. Um, leaving the leaves on your garden. This is another kind of maintenance um, practice tradition that we have that is not advantageous to our wildlife. Um, which is raking all the leaves out of our garden, putting them in bags, and shipping them off. Um, there was a, a great campaign last fall by the Xerxes Society. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they're a wonderful um, nonprofit devoted to invertebrate conservation, and they've done some really wonderful things to promote pollinator conservation. So they did a big campaign called Leave the Leaves. And um, I wasn't aware, I think the statistic is it's like 90% of um, of caterpillars um, actually pupate under leaf litter. Mm -hmm. And so when we rake up all of our leaves and ship them off, we're oftentimes um, breaking up the cocoons of a lot of different um, moths and butterflies. The luna moth is just one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, um, leaves are not great for a lawn. Um, you are going to kill your grass if you don't rake them off a lawn but they make a wonderful mulch in your garden. So leave them in your garden, let them be there. Um, they become a, just a natural mulch to use. Okay, I think this is my, my last one here. Um, to advertise your efforts, um, put some signage out there. We put some signage in our garden today. Uh, a lot of these landscapes that we are promoting, it is a different aesthetic, we have to admit that. Um, a lot of these plants are tall, um, you know, we encourage you to plant really densely. They're not uniform landscapes. They are more naturalistic aesthetic. Um, and oftentimes, um, signage can not only educate people what you're doing, but it also adds some legitimacy to the garden itself, to what people might question is maybe a garden that's not being maintained as well as it should be. Uh, you stick some signage out there, that's great. So that's some signage I have in my own garden. Uh, I went on Etsy. Website has all kinds of cool handmade stuff for the top sign. Um, the middle sign is from the Xerxes Society, and then um, also wanted to highlight that it's a pesticide free zone. Okay, before I wrap up, I wanted to mention um, 
our online course, which is part of our efforts here at Pollinate New England. Um, Daphne Minner, who's over there, who a lot of you have met, um, you should have all met on your way in here, um, has been um, instrumental in putting together the online course. Um, so it's a really wonderful course. I've taken it. I've done some things in that online course. Um, it is free. You can access it through the New England Wildflower Society website. Um, and it goes even more in depth on gardening for pollinators than what we covered here um, tonight. And it's up until August 3rd. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, and I will turn it over to you. Maybe hold questions for the end. Should we have questions in there? Do you want to take a few questions now and then we'll break for 15 minutes? Yeah. And then, okay, yeah. cool. Question right here. Uh, you mentioned um, sort of preferring not to use wood mulch, mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned leaf mulch. Is leaf mulch something that can be obtained commercially, or do you mean by that uh, mulching leaves on your own and using those? Yeah, so I, I would actually ask you all, is leaf mulch commercially available in this yes. area? I'm seeing yes. a lot yes. of yeses, yes. Yes. which is fantastic because that's where I am, it's okay. not, which is really frustrating. So it is commercially available um, here. Or you just can also them. make your own. You okay. can just mulch mulch. your leaves. Just sure. mow your leaves. Yes, yeah. mow your leaves yeah. and make a mulch out of them. Yeah. Or even just leaving them there if they leave fall in your garden. Or you One of the issues with mowing is that you can also, in addition to breaking up the leaves themselves, you're also probably chopping up the chrysalises. So <laughs> it's preferred to like remove the leaves from the lawn area but relocate them to the garden or something like that if you can do it. Or a compost pile. Yeah. Leaves mold too if you leave it for a couple of years in a pile and that's great mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it is with the mulching it's sort of it's a balancing act because you know it would be wonderful if we could not mulch at all but then we have issues with watering and weeds so it's it's really it's kind of finding the solution and kind of the best compromise that you can. Is there some danger that some of the large flat leaves can kind of seal the water in? I was told that once, if you mulch with them mm -hmm. without breaking them up. Yeah, I'm I'm chomping at the bit. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we, so at Garden in the Woods, we. Um, uh, for historically for many decades we shredded all of our leaves in the fall um, and then used them spread them back in the garden as as a mulch so they were nice finely shredded leaves um, we stopped doing that about three years ago uh, and now we just blow all of our leaves back off of the trails um, we do you know pay attention to some of the really low growing plants like ground covers like flocks uh, and try to remove the leaves from those in, in spring if the leaves have really piled up quite a bit. Uh, but we find that pretty much everything grows right up through the leaf litter without any problem. Uh, retaining moisture in the garden is a good thing. Uh, leaves are really effective for doing that. Um, so yeah, we that Leave the Leaves campaign, we've really taken to heart. Uh, it's exactly how we manage the garden at, at Garden in the Woods now. And it saves on uh, fossil fuel burning, it saves on labor. Uh, we don't have to do as much work in the garden in the fall or in the spring, um, and to be honest, has very little impact. If anything, uh, it's probably gonna help with our earthworm populations. We have a base of earthworms in the garden, and mm -hmm. shredding the leaves really helped to kind of boost their, their population, so we're really mm -hmm. hopeful that that'll actually help um, with their numbers as well, so. I just wanna ask, just related to that, Oakley, are there any trees or any types of leaves that you're a little more cautious about? Or oak, any maple, oak, you know? Yeah, we have primarily oak. We're sycamore. mostly an oak forest, so we don't have any sycamores really, but um, the garden is mostly oak, red oak, black oak, white oak. So. What about Norway? We don't have Norway maples in the garden. Uh, maple, maple leaves tend to break down a lot more quickly. Uh, and really with Norway's, it's not so much the leaves that you need to worry about, it's the, it's the seeds. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. But I don't have much to offer. I have a question about the carpenter bees. Mm -hmm. The holes that they've made in my uh, in my railings, do they reuse those holes or do they do new ones? In other words, should I fill them after the season or? I believe they use new ones that they don't reuse. Mm -hmm. So um, you're okay. So I don't know, has anybody I think seen they do. anything? You, they, I think they do reuse. They, no, I don't think they reuse them. I think 
yes. make them new every year. So it's okay yeah. to... Yeah, so they just want to clean... Yeah, because disease would build up in the hole. Yeah. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay. So I'm not killing if I no. fill them up in the... Depends on, make sure you do it at the time the time of the year that you do so it. So what would it be? Winter? Um, or? They're looking to nest in the springtime when they come out. So, yeah. so I think if you would do it in the fall. Late fall, winter? Yeah. I, I mean, I would, yes. They're carpenter bees. I mean, they're sort of a nuisance, so I would fill them any time. Oh, you're so mean. They have other places they can go. They have other places they can go. Shoot, don't have to go. This isn't really related. I just want to know where bees go in the winter. Um, so it varies from species to species, but there um, a lot of them will, um, as adults, they only survive for one season, and then they'll lay their eggs, um, and they will, um, so over the winter, the eggs will be in the ground, and then they emerge in the spring. Um, some bees do have longer life cycles like that, where they will go underground um, during the winter, but most of them um, will just be adults during the summer, and then will... Um, lay eggs and then the eggs. Are any like honeybees that have a second crop of bees that take care of the winter time? And the only other, there are some um, bumblebees that live socially in colonies together, um, but none of them are as elaborate as honeybees. Honeybees are very unique <laughs> in their, their entire sort of <coughs> I don't know if you, you uh, announced it, but in the Massachusetts state legislature, legislation, uh, Massachusetts House Bill um, 4101, I think, is protecting the pollinators. So last week, my bee club was urging people to call your rep to say, hey, please support this bill on the vote on the floor. Okay. Um, awesome. Well, Mark just whispered that he's going to talk about that. Awesome. So. <laughs> okay, so let's jump into our 15-minute break here. Um, so I encourage you to get some refreshments, wander outside, take a look at the garden. Um, we won't do any sort of formal presentation of the garden, but we'll be around to answer questions. We'll also be here um, this evening. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, so uh, thank you for coming back. Um, it's always nice when people walk outside and then still are willing to come back into the room. <laughs> um, so what, for my part of the presentation, we'll, what I'll be spending uh, a bunch of time talking about is what it means for a plant to be native, um, and then how to choose the right native plants for your garden. Um, and then a list of uh, several of the species that are in the in the garden that was installed this afternoon. Um, so uh, native is uh, is a term that's used pretty often, but it's a term that I think also uh, is still pretty confusing for folks. Um, so what what I hope to do in the next series of slides is sort of give you an indication as to how we define native. We have a couple of different ways for defining native for the Wildflower Society, and I'll talk about those uh, those sort of different purposes for when we call something native versus when we don't. Um, uh, there's really no you know, solid, tried and true definition, definition for what it means to be native, uh, partially because we have to think about when and where we're talking about, first of all, okay? Um, so I, I, uh, I researched a little bit uh, just to see what other organizations offer for definitions for native. Uh, first is Wikipedia, then the National Wildlife Federation, and then the Kansas Wild Plant Society. The Kansas Wild Plant Society had like two pages uh, devoted, to, uh, devoted to what it means to be native on their website, so I just grabbed a little snippet of it. Um, and I won't force you to read the whole entire uh, definition in each case, but some themes emerge from definitions that you see. Uh, oftentimes those themes are you know, a, a specific place, a specific point in time, uh, uh, something you know, like indigenous is oftentimes thrown out there. Um, but really the bottom line is there's, there's really no rock solid definition for native. Uh, Annie showed uh, an image with echinacea, for example, uh, purple coneflower. Uh, before she mentioned that it was native to the uh, prairie, um, just show of hands, how many of you thought of that as a native New England species? Okay. It's okay. I <laughs> uh, there's, so there's half a dozen, maybe 10 people in the audience that, that think pep purple coneflower is native. 
Um, you know, it's native if, if your definition for native is uh, native to the United States, right? So if that's your definition, then you're doing great. You're, you're meeting the definition. Um, but we try to get a little bit more refined um, and try to work with plants that are, uh, you know, have adapted and evolved uh, in a specific region um, over time because we find that that's the best way to build a resilient garden, one that supports pollinators and other beneficial insects and wildlife. Um, and so that's, that's really what we try to focus on with the Wildflower Society. So typically, as I mentioned, there's two factors that people look toward. Um, first is time, and second, uh, which is a little bit different, is method of introduction. Um, so what do we mean by time, right? Well, we, we're here in this fairly new country, uh, right? We're just a few hundred years old. Um, and for us, you know, we can look back to a period before European settlement um, and say, well, that was the untouched, you know, American landscape. So before uh, European settlers arrived, um, people generally assume that this was just a, a wilderness that uh, really was untouched by, uh, by man. Uh, after European settlement, uh, it was no longer the case. Uh, we you know, started bringing plants in from all over the world. Uh, the first uh, European settlers brought you know, kitchen herbs with them, um, brought plants that they found very particularly useful, brought new agricultural crops. Um, so that's the time period that we as Americans can look back to. But if you're a European, it's really hard to do that, right? Uh, it's really hard to look back millennia and say, is this a plant that was, you know, was here before people or, or not? Because the, the time frame is a lot larger. Um, so what probably makes more sense is to look back and decide, is this a plant that occurred here naturally? Or is it a plant that was moved here by a person? Um, so rather than looking at a specific time period, uh, let's consider just looking at how a plant came to be in a particular place. Um, so, you know, for, for our purposes with the Wildflower Society, we really look at, you know, is this a plant that migrated here naturally, or is it a plant that was moved up the coast, uh, or across an ocean, or across a mountain, and introduced from someplace else in the world? Um, for our horticultural purposes, we really try to take a pretty broad definition for what it means to be native. We look at plants that are native to a particular ecoregion as opposed to a particular county or a particular state. Um, so this is a map showing the ecoregions that exist uh, in New England. There are five of them all together. Um, from the northeastern highlands to the northeastern coastal zone. Uh, we're here in the northeastern coastal zone, right? Just in southeastern Massachusetts, somewhere around there. Um, the Acadian plains, plains and hills. You know, in, in Maine and up into uh, into Canada, uh, the Eastern Great Lakes and Hudson Lowlands, which is you know Western Vermont uh, and throughout uh, throughout New York, uh, and then the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barren, which we share with um, parts of New Jersey uh, and Long Island and uh, and really the Cape and the Islands. So when you start to look at plants that naturally occurred or naturally moved into one of these particular ecoregions, as opposed to plants that were introduced. Um, by people in, that, in those particular ecoregions, you get a better sense for you know, whether plants naturally evolved, what, whether plants are uh, well adapted to those particular site conditions uh, that exist in those ecoregions, um, and whether those plants will be supportive of pollinators and other wildlife. Um, <clears throat> so, looking at that uh, a little bit further, um, here's a plant that uh, Annie also mentioned, Baptisia australis. This is the uh, false indigo. People familiar with uh, Baptisia australis? Okay. Uh, is this a native species or a, or a non-native um, species here in New England? Um, any guesses? I haven't explained what the range map means, so you might not understand. Um, all right, so Baptisia australis is native in this cluster of counties right here in the center of the country, right? Um, so it's, uh, it's really more of a, I don't know, would you consider that the Midwest, the, the, the Plains? This is the Plains, right? The, that region of the country, uh, Great Plains. Uh, it's not native to New England, but it's a, it's a perfectly hardy plant. It does very well in our, uh, in our region, but it's not, it's not really native to New England. <clears throat> What about one that you might be uh, a little more familiar with? Um, Tiarella cordifolia, or fo foam flower. Um, show of hands, who's familiar with Tiarella cordifolia? Great. So foam flower is a very common garden plant. Um, this is the natural range for Tiarella cordifolia variety Kalina. 
uh, which is a, um, a, a variety, a botanical variety of T. relicordifolia that has a distinct difference from the other botanical variety of T. relicordifolia, uh, this one, T. relicordifolia variety portfolia. Now, uh, botanists um, sometimes get really, um, uh, uh, I'd say, a little loopy about defining, you know, um, botanical varieties or forms or really splitting species or lumping species together. Uh, this is one where foam flower, the northern variety of foam flower and the southern variety of foam flower have a very distinct uh, difference in growth habit. Um, the southern Tiarella cordifolia, this one, variety Kalina, is a clumping species. Um, so it doesn't send out runners. Uh, it doesn't really form a, a dense mat of foliage on the ground. It really clumps. Um, and that's how it behaves, and that's how every uh, cultivated variety of Tiarella cordifolia, variety Kalina, also behaves. Um, most of the cultivated varieties of Tiarella cordifolia that are on the market are derived from the southern uh, uh, botanical variety rather than the northern botanical variety, uh, which does actually send out runners, forms a really dense uh, mat of foliage, uh, and is a really effective ground cover um, versus the southern variety. So here's a case where we've got a, a, a botanical variety of a specific species that's native in northern, uh, uh, northeastern United States versus a botanical variety that's native more uh, in more southeastern United States, uh, and two very distinctive differences between the two. Um, so I hope that I've effectively confused you, uh, <laughs> because that's really what I, what I was what I was attempting to do. Uh, because really, the the idea behind what a plant, uh, where a plant is native, when a plant is native, and why that's important uh, is still you know up for debate essentially. Um, for New England Wildflower Society, we really focus on plants that are native to the ecoregions of New England. When we're selecting plants for gardens, we, we choose plants that are native to those ecoregions um, because we feel like they're well adapted to our climate, they're well adapted to our soils, they're well adapted to our weather patterns, um, and so we know that they'll perform well in our, in our gardens. Um, for our conservation work, uh, we're more focused on um, uh, uh, plants that are native to particular states, um, but for horticultural purposes and for, for your purposes as gardeners, we really try to encourage you to think about using plants that are native to that broad geographical range that's, uh, that's represented by the ecoregion map that I showed you earlier. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's so anyway, choosing native plants, choosing to work with native plants, uh, it, it's important that you choose plants that are native to those ecoregions so that you choose plants that are well adapted uh, and will work well in your gardens uh, and, and establish themselves and not require a whole lot of care and maintenance once you've, once you've, uh, once you've gotten them established in your garden. Um, the question of why to work with native plants um, is another very broad discussion point. Um, we have uh, just a short list of uh, sort of recommended talking points uh, and ideas for why we think it's important to work with native plants in the, in the landscape, and, and here they are. Um, first of all, native plants are adapted to our climate, our soils, our, our hydrology, our weather patterns, just like I mentioned before. Uh, and what that means for you as a gardener is that working with native plants means that you can develop and build a resilient garden uh, that will perform well uh, without a whole lot of care and feeding. As long as you've selected the right plant, um, for your particular site conditions, which we'll talk about in, the, in a little bit. Um, so when properly sited, those plants won't need fertilizer, they won't need irrigation, they'll really need minimal care and maintenance from you. And that's, from my perspective, that's one of the most important reasons for working with native plants. Um, I don't, I, I'm a pretty lazy gardener, uh, and I really try to encourage other people to be lazy gardeners and to think about um, being as lazy a gardener as you can. You know, leaving your garden messy is great for pollinators, um, um, you know, having, uh, working with native species means you don't have to really care um, for them as, you mu as much as you might need to for um, plants from other parts of the world. Um, as we've discussed, uh, as Annie discussed, and, and uh, sort of the whole point of this program, uh, native plants provide habitat for pollinators, for other beneficial wildlife. Uh, they really form the foundation of every ecosystem in the entire world when you think about it. 
Um, so working with native plants means that you're going to be supporting native birds uh, and other native wildlife and attracting those uh, important critters to your garden. Uh, and that's something that I think we all uh, can appreciate is very important. Um, working with natives and building a garden uh, that's primarily um, uh, planted with native plants also helps to represent the unique regional character of a site. Um, so, you know, we, we like to say that it helps us establish a local sense of place. Um, if I was to ask you in the audience, uh, what sort of um, iconic New England landscape feature, uh, what might you say? Anything? It could be anything. It doesn't have to be a plant. Stone. 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 Exactly. What, a, what about stone? What about stone in particular? Stone walls. Stone walls, right? Stone. How about stone walls running through the forest, yeah. right? Uh, stone walls sort of falling apart on the edges of a farm field. Um, you know that that really ties our connection in with our agrarian roots. It ties our connection in with with you know our history here as New Englanders. It's a very iconic um, piece of our of our landscape. Um, now, what do you think about red dyed mulch? Um, is that a is that a is that something that really elicits an emotional response? Um, okay, I, I can appreciate that, but it, does, it, does it elicit the same emotional response no. as a stone wall? No, it doesn't, right? Um, could you hop off of an airplane in you know Southwest Arizona and expect to see red mulch in the landscape? Yes. Um, probably, probably, right? If you go to a strip mall, you'll probably see red mulch someplace. Um, so you know, they're working with native plants it allows us to um, to not uh, you know have that sort of cookie cutter landscape that a lot of other parts of the world really represent. Uh, working with natives allows us to represent that unique regional character uh, like the stone wall running through the forest does for New England. Uh, and so finally, native plants are really beautiful. I mean, there's really gorgeous native plants for us to choose from. Um, and, you know, we, I, we think it's important that you look to what's native, what's, uh, what's you know, uh, what's, what occurs around you naturally before you start to look outside uh, and, and start to introduce plants from other parts of the world. Um, Annie mentioned Doug Tallamy's work uh, and the idea that you know 60 to 80 percent of what's planted in our built landscapes is non-native is pretty frightening, um, but it also means there's a lot of room for natives in the landscape. There's a lot of room for some some really fantastic native plants uh, and a lot of room for for more of them. <coughs> um, there are lots of lists of pollinator plants out there. Uh, we have uh, you know we we come up with lists all the time. Uh, this is one that we whipped up just a few weeks ago. You know, the top 25 native plants for supporting wildlife and pollinators uh, in, in New England. Um, before we have a list like this, or before you consider a list like this, what I really want you to think about is what your site conditions are like um, before you start introducing plants into your garden. So, for example, on this list, we have, um, let's choose one. We've got uh, birch. Um, now, what birches do we have in the New England landscape? Um, what native birches are available to you? Anyone know? Yellow birch. You had yellow birch. Right, that's a good one. What else? River, River birch. River birch is River. another good one. Uh, what else do we have? Gray. Gray. Did I hear gray birch? Okay, gray birch. What about black birch? Um, so there's there's four or five, right? Paper birch is another one. Um, now, if you if you look at a list like this and see birch. Uh, SPP, that just means birch species. Birch species are really uh, important um, host plants for, uh, for a bunch of different moths and butterflies, Lepidoptera species. Um, now, if you have a wet garden uh, or a dry garden, you're going to choose a different birch, right, to suit your site conditions. And so, you know, when you look at a, at a list like this, it's very easy to go out to the garden center and say, okay, I, I have this pollinator list. I really like all the plants that are on this list. I'm building a pollinator garden. Um, and to bring them all home and, and, and to not know uh, if they're you know, well suited to your site. Um, so it's important when we're making plant selections um, that we're choosing the right plant for the specific site conditions that we have to work with. Um, so. When choosing the right plant, first we want to understand our site conditions. Uh, we want to know if we've got a dry site or a wet site, sunny site, shady site. Uh, we really want to make sure that we're selecting plants that are well adapted to the particular site conditions that we have. 
Um, you guys recognize this one? Milkweed. Milkweed. No. What, what <coughs> species of milkweed? Oh. Anyone know? Swamp. I hear swamp milkweed, right? I like to use rose milkweed instead of swamp milkweed, but yeah, this, is, this is rose milkweed. So rose milkweed is one of the plants in the, uh, the garden that you just saw, um, and it's a species that prefers moister soils. It'll work in average garden soils, but it really prefers moister soils. Um, that, in contrast with butterfly milkweed, which prefers drier, more well-drained soils. Um, so site conditions, we're thinking about soil, we're thinking about sun, and we're thinking about moisture levels. Um, so uh, soil, you know, do you have sandy soils? Do you have heavy clay in your soil? Uh, do you have, you know, adequate organic matter in your soil? Um, these are all things that you have to consider before you even think about um, choosing a plant off of a list like the one that I showed you just a second ago. Um, is your garden in full sun? Is it in part sun? Is it in full shade? How much moisture do you have? Is this a garden that's well drained uh, and is usually dry after a rain event or is it a garden that is you know, pretty much wet all the time? Um, these are the kinds of things that you have to think about before you ever think about uh, you know, digging, a plant, uh, digging a hole for a plant and putting it in the ground. Um, this is bearberry, Arctostaphylus uva ursi. Uh, this is a plant that's native to most of the uh, 48 states, the contiguous 48 states and up into Canada. Um, so it grows in a wide range of temperature conditions. It can tolerate you know, very hot and humid summers, can tolerate really cold. Uh, winter conditions up in Canada, uh, but it really absolutely has to have well-drained soils and full sun. Otherwise, it will not be happy. Um, so if you've tried to grow bearberry in the past and you've tried to grow it in a little bit of shade, uh, or if you've tried to grow it in a spot that's a little more moist uh, and has heavier soils, it's not going to thrive. It won't do well. Um, so the bottom line is you've got to make sure that you have the right site conditions for the particular plant that you're choosing. Um, you also have to have adequate space for that plant, right? Uh, and this isn't always obvious when you're you know, the guy that planted this oak tree 30 years ago, or the, uh, the, the woman that planted this oak tree 30 years ago, wasn't really thinking necessarily about how big that tree was going to get. Um, but you've got to always make sure that you have adequate space for the plants that you're, that you're putting in. And that's not always you know, uh, obvious. Maybe you've got a, a constriction that's going to really uh, really um, uh, make it difficult for an oak tree to grow an adequate size root system uh, in a you know, sidewalk hole or something like that. So you know, be thinking about the root system as well, not just the top. Um, don't ever be the person that plants an oak tree under power lines. <laughs> Um, next, you should consider more than just ornamental traits. Uh, and I won't dwell on this because I think Andy did a nice job of covering a lot of this. Um, but you really ought to be thinking about you know, how your plants were grown, uh, whether they were grown through clonal propagation or whether they were grown from uh, wild collected seed. Um, the plants that we grow in Asami Farm, the plants that we planted in the garden uh, earlier today, uh, are all grown from seed that was collected from the wild. We're really interested in building a genetically diverse, uh, developed landscape, and, and the best way to do that is to choose plants that are grown from seed that's been collected from your local area, collected from the wild, uh, as opposed to uh, choosing plants that have been grown uh, using clonal methods, like divisions or cuttings or tissue culture. Um, I know this is sometimes a difficult issue for people. Um, so plants are uh, reproduced in a number of different ways. Um, what we're talking about when we discuss pollinators is ace or sexual reproduction, right? Um, pollen moves from one flower to another, and a fruit is developed, and that fruit contains seed. Um, with clonal propagation, we're really talking about asexual propagation. Um, so you take a cutting off of a plant, you stick it in some rooting hormone, that plant then grows roots uh, and becomes its own plant uh, and can live and grow on its own, but it's a clone of the previous plant. And most of the plants that we grow and, and uh, um, uh, uh, plant out in the landscape are propagated clonally. It's a very quick, uh, very, you know, uh, very easy way to, um, to grow more plants, and so most uh, most growers are doing it this way. Unfortunately, it, it uh, sometimes has uh, sometimes leads to unintended consequences. Um, so Andy did a nice job of covering native cultivars, and I won't dwell on this too much. Uh, one thing that she didn't mention is through the course of her research, um, she identified a cultivar of um, an artificialosa that wasn't hardy in northern New England gardens. 
Um, and this is not something that you would know if, if you're reading the plant label or, or uh, you know, considering purchasing uh, this plant for your garden. This is Menarda fistulosa, Claire Grace. This was propagated in Mississippi, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Menarda fistulosa, Claire Grace is a cultivar of wild bergamot uh, that happens to have been selected from a plant that was found in Mississippi. Um, and so wild bergamot's a perfectly hardy native species. Um, but ones growing in Mississippi are better adapted to warmer climates than they are to colder climates. Uh, and so this one turns out to not be winter hardy. Um, so as a gardener, you're buying a native species uh, that should be hardy to zone three or zone four. Uh, and yet it's not because it was propagated off a plant that was from Mississippi. Um, so this is one of the things that can happen when we, when we choose plants that are clonally propagated uh, as opposed to choosing plants that have been grown from uh, locally, uh, locally collected seed. There are a variety of other reasons why we might do this, including support for, uh, for beneficial insects and pollinators. Um, but as a gardener, what I'm really thinking about is, is this plant going to thrive uh, in my particular site? Um, here's another representation, another example of that. Uh, and this is why we uh, are very careful to select um, plants from, uh, from, from our local area. Um, this is Viburnum lantanoides, the hobblebush viburnum. Uh, the plants on the uh, picture in the top um, versus the plants in the picture at the bottom. What do you notice about the two? Much larger foliage in the plants in the top image, right? Uh, um, so what, really what you're looking at are about 150 different plants uh, in uh, actually quite a few more than that in small pots. Um, so the, the, the plants in the top image are a hobble bush that were grown from seed that was collected in Connecticut uh, versus the plants in the bottom image which were grown um, from seed that was collected in Maine. Um, so the Connecticut selection uh, perfectly adapted to very warm greenhouse conditions at, uh, in western Massachusetts, whereas the Maine uh, collection uh, really struggled in the summer heat. This is a very extreme example um, of this kind of thing, but it's, it's exactly why we're concerned with um, selecting plants and growing plants that have been, um, uh, that have been um, grown from seed that was produced locally by wild populations. Okay, so you're considering more than ornamental traits. You understand your site conditions. Uh, now it's important you select a, a plant that's healthy uh, and one that will do well once you bring it home and plant it out in your garden. Um, anyone know what's going on here in this image? Yeah, there's a, an example of a girdling root, right? Um, so this is a this is a tree. This happens to be a Nissus sylvatica that was grown in a nursery. Uh, and as typically happens in in nurseries, um, the plant uh, the plant's root system was not very well maintained when moving from a small pot. Uh, to a larger pot. So in a nursery, you, you know, usually grow things in a small pot um, for a time and then move them up into a larger pot, um, you know, expanding the pot size as the plant gets bigger and bigger until it's ready for sale. And oftentimes uh, uh, those, those root systems aren't treated very well uh, and deficiencies aren't, um, aren't corrected at that time. And so you wind up with plants um, in nurseries that have girdling roots buried beneath the soil, uh, unbeknownst to you as the consumer. Um, so it's important when you go to a garden center that you're not just inspecting the top growth of a plant, but you're also inspecting the root system. Um, for those of you that attend, attended the workshop today, when you pulled one of our plants out of, uh, out of the plug tray, it had a very healthy, you know, really, uh, uh, really well-developed root system. Um, but gi given a few more weeks in that pot, um, that plant's going to get pot bound and will really need to be either planted out into the landscape or moved up into a larger size pot. Um, and this happens frequently in the, in the garden and nursery industry. Um, plants spend too much time in a, in a particular size pot and you end up with girdling roots uh, that cause problems uh, in the landscape once those plants are planted. So always pull your plants out of the pot before you purchase them. Um, every good garden center will allow you to inspect a root system. Uh, if your garden center doesn't allow you to pull plants out of the pot, then you should really try to find another garden center. Um, when you're buying a plant, you're buying the whole package. Um, so before you spend your money, you should really be looking and, and inspecting that root system to make sure that you've got a healthy plant that's going to do well once you bring it home. A um, couple things to look for, you know, obviously on the top growth, inspect for foliage, inspect the foliage and stems for signs of disease or insect pests. 
Um, and uh, inspect that root system. Look for a root flare on woody species in particular. That point where the, the stem starts to swell, uh, that's where the first uh, roots really come off. A lot of times that's planted about two or three inches too deep in the pot. Um, so that's something that you should really be uh, really tr trying to avoid and expecting that you'll have to re repair or correct once you, once you bring it home if you do get a plant that's been potted too deeply. Um, so, you know, pull it out, uh, don't, don't hesitate to uh, pull a little bit of the soil um, off of the root ball, really, really sort of inspect it, um, look for some of the larger deficiencies like girdling roots, signs of encircling roots, um, because those are really the things that are going to make your plants fail once you bring them home. There are some resources to look for. This is particular for, uh, particularly for woody plant species. The Urban Tree Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in uh, on the west, uh, on the west, in the western United States. I forget if it's California or uh, Washington State. Um, but they are the organization that publishes all the research of a guy named Ed Gilman at the University of Florida, uh, who has done all of his research in the last 20 or 30 years on plant establishment, landscape establishment of trees and shrubs. They give lots of great uh, recommendations for how to deal with um, a, a, a deficient root system uh, if you do wind up with one of these plants at home, um, including how to treat a root ball. Um, they've done research on, you know, if you have a, a, a pot with encircling roots, should you slice an inch off of that whole entire pot? Um, should you slice the pot in half and fan it out and plant it that way? Um, should you just tease the roots out? Uh, you know, what's the best strategy for dealing with encircling roots? This is the kind of research that they do, and it's all published um, through the Urban Tree Foundation. Um, they also publish uh, some really great um, uh, cards and uh, guidance that you can give to landscape contractors. Um, so if you're working with landscape <coughs> contractors, you can print out, you know, in English and Spanish um, cards that you can hand to them and say, this is how I want you to plant my trees or my shrubs. I want you to, you know, plant them at this depth. I want you to treat the root ball in such a way. Uh, and so this is definitely a great resource that you as, as, uh, as landscape consumers should definitely look, look toward. Um, and then finally, less is more. Um, try to select the smallest plant you possibly can uh, that you're comfortable with and just plant more of them. Um, so for today's pollinator garden, uh, we, we installed 150 plants in a 150 square foot garden. Um, so each plant was planted on about one foot centers. Uh, we fully expect that those plants will establish quickly uh, and sort of knit together within just a single season. Um, and that's really the goal, right? We really want plants to be uh, growing uh, very closely together so that we can minimize our maintenance requirements, minimize our weeding requirements, retain uh, moisture, minimize the need for mulch uh, applications every season. There's lots of benefits to having plants touch each other. Um, it really is okay for plants to touch each other in the landscape. Uh, it's how they grow in nature and it's really how they should grow in your garden as well. Um, and so here's an example in the image on the left of uh, uh, the typical landscape plug that we plant at Garden in the Woods. They're about four inches deep, two and a half inches wide, um, very small plants, grown from seed, probably just uh, a few months old, um, but perfectly uh, capable of establishing themselves in the landscape uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and that's the, that's the size plant that I would recommend everybody try to um, shoot for when selecting perennials for your garden. Um, and if landscape plugs aren't available, and they oftentimes aren't, um, then look for four inch pots, one quart pot. Um, don't go much larger than a one quart pot. Uh, you're basically just paying for soil um, if you purchase anything larger than a one quart pot. Um, so that's, that's my spiel about that. We sell lots of two quart pots. Um, we sell some one gallon pots. So I know our plant sales uh, person would be upset with me if, if she heard me say that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the, the, the keys to the castle. Plant small. Um, and then finally, uh, as Andy mentioned, you should really be trying to avoid uh, systemic insecticides. Um, systemic insecticides are sold under a number of different trade names. Uh, they're available commercially. They're available in the retail market. Uh, they're uh, they typically, um, uh, in their advertising and promotion, talk about uh, season-long control. So, for example, this Bear Advanced um, Tree and Shrub offers 12 months of protection against grubs uh, and other insect pests in the landscape. If you see something that says season-long control, it's likely a, a systemic insecticide and something you should avoid altogether. 
Um, and as the, the gentleman in the back mentioned, um, there is legislation proposed in Massachusetts to put some restrictions on uh, neonics uh, in particular. So neonics are a, are a specific class of systemic insecticide. Um, it, the legislation that's proposed does a number of different things. Uh, it makes neonics restricted use pesticides, which means unless you have a pesticide applicator's license, you can't purchase them, you can't apply them. Um, that's just a sort of common sense um, strategy to limiting the, the use of these uh, really pretty harmful and dangerous pesticides in the landscape. Um, it limits applications during bloom time, which probably doesn't have a huge impact on, uh, or doesn't have as big of an impact as we would like. Uh, requires pesticide applicators to give notice of risks associated with neonics to pollinators. Um, so that's, you know, if you hire a tree care company to spray your trees uh, and they're going to use a systemic insecticide like a neonic, they have to tell you what the risks are for, uh, to pollinators and other, uh, and then also give you alternative products that can be used that are less harm harmful to pollinators. Um, it also uh, requires integration of neonic training into regular pesticide training that's already, uh, that's already on the docket. The legislation does a number of important things. Uh, I think first and foremost, it makes neonics restricted use pesticides, uh, and that's, that really needs to happen. So if you're in a position to give your Congress people a call, uh, this bill is stalled in committee. Um, so you know, if you know your local state rep or your local senator, um, give them a call and, and ask them to su support the bill. Uh, I think about 75% of the uh, representatives in the House um, uh, are supportive of the bill, um, but it's just stalled in committee and the session ends, uh, I think, the very end of July. So pretty short time frame to get this thing passed. Um, but anyway, um, when, when you've figured out uh, what your site conditions are and you've figured out uh, what space you have to accommodate plants in your garden, um, there's a couple of tools that you can look for um, to select plants. So one is our new plant finder tool. This is a, a resource you can find on our website. It's just plantfinder.newenglandwild.org. Um, what this uh, database allows you to do is search for specific criteria when selecting plants. You can choose plants that are adapted to full sun, part sun, shade, dry soils, wet soils, uh, clay soils, sandy soils, um, pollinator support, host plants. Uh, there's a whole range of different selections you can make to choose plants um, for your garden and uh, it, the system will spit out a list for you of the you know, best plants for your particular application. Um, it also allows you to select your ecoregion. Um, so in our case, we're in the northeastern coastal zone, so if you're interested in planting plants that are native to your particular ecoregion, this is the only resource that I know that's available that allows you to do that. Um, so it's a, a great way to find uh, a short list of native species that will work in your garden, support pollinators, uh, and uh, you know, establish well and, and be low uh, maintenance, um, uh, sorry, be low maintenance for the life of your garden. Um, there are plenty of other resources available, but uh, that's the one that I did want to mention. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is just go over a, a short list of the species that we planted today. Um, there are about 21 plants in the garden altogether, and I think I probably have about 10 to cover, so I'm not covering every single one of them. Um, but these are some of the, you know, some, some of the fantastic plants that we chose to plant in this garden, um, and some that I would definitely recommend uh, you think about um, for your home garden. This is Agastache funiculum. Uh, now, you'll hear people pronounce this in a number of different ways, um, but uh, Latin uh, should always be pronounced with a hard C when you see a CH in the Latin name, uh, and E is always pronounced sort of like an A, Ag Agastache. Uh, Agastache funiculum, the lavender giant hyssop. Uh, this is a plant that's in the mint family, so like all plants in the mint family, it has a square stem. Uh, it's a species that gives sort of mid to late summer bloom, uh, has a really, you know, really attractive lavender colored flower. That's quite tall, um, definitely in the four foot, almost to six foot range on occasion. Um, so this is a pretty tall, robust um, perennial species. Uh, does well, like most of the plants in this garden, in a range of uh, site conditions, but definitely wants full sun, and that's where, that's where it'll be happiest in your garden. 
treading on wetter soils, um, but will certainly do fine in, uh, in the average garden soil. Um, Andropogon glomeratus, this is a, a, a species that's fairly new for us, uh, not one that we've worked with a whole lot. Um, uh, bushy blue stem, this is an example of a warm season grass. Uh, there are a lot of other blue stems. There's little blue stem, there's big blue stem. Um, this is one that's um, fairly little known in the landscape trade. Um, I doubt this is a grass that you've seen very often, um, but it's very cool. This is an image, this was taken by Bill Kalina, uh, and this is an image of the seed head. So this is what it does late in the season. Uh, it gets maybe about three feet tall. Um, sometimes I've seen it maybe four or five feet tall, but it's generally in the sort of three foot range. Um, gets that really attractive seed head. I know it's a little blurry um, and hard to see, but it is very, very, uh, and a super attractive grass. Uh, very colorful, rich browns uh, um, in, in uh, late summer into fall. And a fat, fantastic plant for rain gardens. Andropoga glomeratus can deal with um, periodic uh, you know, inundations with water and long stretches of dry conditions. A um, couple species of butterfly milk, or of milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. I think this is my favorite Asclepius. Uh, this one has just really bulletproof foliage, so very dark green foliage in contrast with those brightly orange flowers. Um, you can't go wrong with Asclepius tuberosa. It's definitely a plant that wants full sun and wants pretty well-drained soils, um, but it'll take you know moist and average garden soils as well. Um, this one doesn't seem to be as attractive to monarch caterpillars. Uh, as the other milkweed species, um, but it is just a fantastic garden plant. I think it's one of the, one of the best. Um, a fairly well-behaved Asclepius as well. Um, obviously, like all Asclepius, uh, it has these beautiful um, seed heads, you know, unleashes those seeds in the, in the late summer into fall. Uh, and this one also has some pretty decent fall color as well. Um, it's probably 12 to 18 inches, uh, more of a clumping species, so sort of a mound like this with bright orange flowers in sort of early to mid-summer. Uh, and, and rose milkweed, which we mentioned a couple of times, or swamp milkweed, I prefer the more attractive sounding rose milkweed. Uh, this one has, you know, the uh, pale sort of pink, um, pink to purple flowers, uh, nice fragrance to it as well. Um, this one's more upright than Asclepius tuberosa. Um, and also does well uh, in fairly wet soils, um, but will also take average garden soil too. So if you have a wetter spot, Asclepius incarnata is a good choice. If you have a drier spot, then Asclepius tuberosa is a good choice. Um, Coloni glabra, the white turtle head, uh, this is an example of a, of a specialist host plant. Um, so Coloni glabra is one of the primary hosts for the Baltimore checker spot. Um, this is a Baltimore checker spot chrysalis there in the center image. Uh, this is a, a fairly rare um, uh, native butterfly species. Um, and it's one that we definitely should be trying to support in our gardens as much as we can. Um, Galoni glabra is one of its primary host plants. Uh, also spice bush, um, so Lindera benzoin is another host for it. Um, but but uh, turtle head is just a fantastic plant for pretty moist um, soils or average garden soils. Uh, and obviously the flower is also quite attractive to a number of different pollinated insect species as well. Um, purple lovegrass is the plant that's sort of this purple cast in the center of the image over there. Uh, it's a warm season grass that gets a uh, uh, really, really nice purple sort of overcast of, seed, of flowers followed by seeds um, in mid to late summer. Um, if you've driven, you know, anywhere on the highways in Massachusetts in July into August, you've definitely seen this plant before and wondered what that purple haze was mm. on the side of the highway. Um, purple lovegrass is a, is a kind of looks like crabgrass, to be honest. It's uh, maybe not the most attractive grass when it's not in, in flower, uh, but it's definitely a very functional um, species. It likes uh, full sun and will definitely take, you know, wet to dry soils, um, takes pretty tolerant of compaction. It's a very tough grass uh, and definitely a, a good alternative to a traditional sort of American uh, or European turf grass. Um, so if you can bear with a coarser stem um, and a grass that you'll need to allow to get a little bit taller to really appreciate that, uh, that purple haze, then this is definitely one that I would recommend. Um, 
Uh, Joe Pie Weeds have had name changes uh, recently, so if you're familiar with like the white snake root that used to be Eupatorium um, lugosum, that's now an Adrotina, uh, and spotted Joe Pie Weed is Eutrochium as opposed to Eupatorium. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, tallest of the plants that we planted in the pollinator garden uh, this afternoon. Purple or spotted Joe pie weed is you know on the on the tall side, four to six feet tall, sometimes a little bit taller uh, in really moist conditions. Um, late summer to early fall bloom time, uh, very nice you know uh, big robust uh, sort of overpowering um, purple flower atop that very tall and upright stem. Uh, this is definitely a plant that needs a little bit of space. Um, but it's also one that can tolerate some perennial pruning uh, right about this time of the year. Um, so if you, you know, maybe toward the middle of June, toward the end of June, um, just cut the plant back, uh, uh, you know, to about six or eight inches tall, um, then you'll have shorter in stature plants blooming uh, later in the season. So there's no harm in cutting those. Um, very tall perennial plants back a little bit earlier in the season, so you get uh, you have them uh, you know a little bit shorter when you uh, when they start to flower later in the season. Um, the cardinal flower, obviously, this is uh, uh, Lobelia cardinalis, the red cardinal flower. This one also has a naturally occurring white mutation. Um, so I know Annie mentioned you know sh uh, uh, shying away from um, color changes. This is an example of a of a plant that just has this naturally occurring white um, variant, and this shows up in our garden from time to time. If you have a lot of purple, or if you have a lot of cardinal flower, um, then you might end up seeing the white one every once in a while. Um, it doesn't show up very often, and it doesn't come true to seed. Although, uh, if we collect seed off of white cardinal flower, um, then we're likely to see more whites from the plants that we grow uh, from that seed. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, a little bit of an oddity, kind of nice to have that albino cardinal flower um, growing in the garden. Um, but the vibrant red of, of cardinal flower is really just to die for. It's definitely a, an amazing plant, great splash of color in mid to late, or in midsummer. Um, one thing about cardinal flower is it really has a biennial stem. Um, and uh, the plant itself tends to sort of act as a biennial. Um, so it's one that you really need to allow to seed itself around in your garden. Um, so, I mean, don't cut it back, allow the seeds to, uh, to spread around, um, and also, you know, make sure that you've got, uh, when you're creating habitat for ground nesting bees by scratching a little bit of mulch away and having some bare soil, uh, those are great places for cardinal flower to, uh, to, to find a little spot to germinate as well. So, um, sometimes a little bit of bare soil can help spread this plant around the garden uh, a little. Um, mountain mints are fantastic pollinator plants. Uh, I have broadleaf mountain mint along my driveway and I can't tell you the diversity of species that I see on that uh, mountain mint when it starts to bloom, including this great blue wasp that I swear is like three inches long uh, and this just iridescent blue, really fantastic looking wasp um, that doesn't care anything about uh, uh, me when I'm brushing against it as I'm getting out of my car in the driveway. Um, so just really, really fantastic uh, plants for supporting a wide diversity of pollinators. Um, but also, you know, fragrant and uh, uh, important mid-season um, flower color, or, or flower in the garden. Um, the narrow leaf <coughs> mountain mint has pretty narrow strap-like foliage versus the uh, broadleaf mountain mint Hoary Mountain Mint, which has uh, uh, slightly broader foliage. Um, these are, you know, 18 to 24 inches tall uh, and tend to spread around quite a bit. Um, so, you know, make sure that you've got the space for them. Um, and then finally, just uh, to finish this off, um, the, the species of goldenrod that we chose to plant in the garden is Solidago odora, or the sweet goldenrod. Um, I have to be honest, I'm not a huge goldenrod person. Um, I do think that the you know combination of yellow and purple that you get with goldenrod and maybe Joe Pie weed is pretty great. Um, but on its uh, on its own, I'm not a huge goldenrod fan. Uh, but Solidago odora is fine. Uh, as far as goldenrods go, this is one that I would plant in my garden. Uh, it's uh, it's a little better behaved than some of the other goldenrods, and definitely gives you that uh, important late summer into early fall. Uh, although these are blooming quite early, 
um, uh, forage for, for pollinators. And Verbena histata, the blue ver vervain, uh, which is just a phenomenal plant. This is an early summer um, bloomer. In fact, the plants that we planted this afternoon are already starting to bloom. Uh, the flower speaks for itself. It's really just absolutely beautiful. Anything in that blue range, I think, is really uh, fantastic as far as garden plants go. Um, and gets quite tall, uh, definitely prefers moisture soils, but it's just a, a phenomenal plant all around. Um, with that, I would like to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for supporting uh, this really important outreach program. Wouldn't have been possible without the grant that they provided us a couple of years ago. Um, and then I'm happy to open it up to any questions and also let you know that uh, uh, the Native Plants for New England Gardens, the book I co-wrote with a, a colleague, is here and available for sale if anyone's interested. No pressure, it's fine. I'm sure you all have a copy of it. <laughs> 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 you have copies of it here for sale. So, um, thank you very much. And I think Annie and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. copies of the plant list for the plants that are out um, in the garden that I placed on the table. So first come, first serve. They're out there. Questions? Sweet. You answered them all. Yeah. I have a question. So because I was involved with the workshop, how um, long would it take for us to start seeing some of the caterpillars and things that would be sort of appearing in the, in the garden. Or even Not the long at all. Um, I mean, just to use monarch uh, and Asclepius, um, I found my first monarch on some Asclepius growing at home uh, just the other day. Um, and so that tells me that monarch butterflies have flown into the area. They're laying eggs on Asclepius right now. And so I would expect that you could see caterpillars on those plants almost immediately. Um, the flowering plants that are out there, you'll, I mean, you'll see bees uh, and butterflies visiting them as soon as that flower is ready to go. Um, so, you know, it's not uncommon for us to be planting things and have, uh, you know, have bees pollinating and visiting them as we're, as we're planting them, as, uh, as we're in the midst of planting them. The pycnanthemum, I would say that's the first plant uh, that's going to bloom pretty heavily shortly, and you'll see a lot of activity on that pycnanthemum for sure. So, right away. Yes. Um, so I have trouble making sure there's always something blooming. Is the plant finder tool, does it uh, allow you to search for like early, late? Yep, mid? yep. It allows you to search by bloom time. Okay, so, great. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good point. And how do we get a hold of that? Uh, it's plantfinder.newenglandwild.org. Or you can just visit our website and find the link to it there. I noticed that there's a, a maple tree yep. out in the garden. Aren't you concerned that in several years when that tree gets larger, it's going to be shading the Sure. Plants? Yep. <laughs> no, I, um, so gardens are always evolving, right? Gardens are always changing, and we have to recognize that and be okay with it. Um, but actually, I think it's uh, that's that's on the south maybe southeastern side of the, I, I forget exactly how we cited it, but the garden, I think, was planted on the south side uh, primarily of that, of that sugar maple. Uh, we'll get, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years of pretty full sun um, out of that site, um, just based on the, you know, the orientation. Um, but if we get, you know, if we get five to seven years and, and some of the plants that are more shade tolerant start to out-compete out -compete the plants that are, you know, in need of more sun, then that's part of the gardening. So, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, in the book, you recommended uh, wild strawberry as yeah. a, a good ground cover. Yep. And you had a picture of these two benches. Uh -huh. And I just thought, if you walked across the wild strawberries to get to the bench, would your feet be covered in berry juice? <laughs> by the time <laughs> <laughs> so for that for that two week period when the strawberries are really fruiting, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but they're so tasty that you'd probably be picking them as you walk to the bench. <laughs> Yes. Um, I understood that bees, that the milkweed isn't good for bees because it weighs them down. Something in the milkweed, they pick up and they bring it back to the to the nest, and and it's not 
What you might be, what you might be thinking about is that milkweeds have a very interesting um, pollen structure. They have what are called pollinia, and they actually look sort of like maple samaras. They hang like this, and sometimes what you'll find is you'll find flies or honeybees stuck in dying or dead, in, um, and particularly in the common milkweed, <laughs> and that's because their legs get caught. So the way the milkweed um, reproduces is the milkweed flower, they come in, they land. These are bumblebees are their natural um, pollinators, which are hefty. They have these little hooks, their hooks get caught on, yeah, they right. carry the pollinia and then take them away. So I haven't heard anything about the latex, which is why milkweed oh. is called what it is, yeah. um, unless they are brushing against it or fully, I haven't seen that or heard that to be an issue. Mm. Oh, okay. Because oh. mm. the latex is not is not as far as I know, part of the flower structure, it's just in the foliage. Sure. So. It's not anything that I've heard, heard before. Mm. Yeah? Well, have they done the DNA analysis on, on this fascinating story you told fairly early about a plant that had a, a variant that was in a different geographical location? Uh, do have any studies been done where they show that a plant mutated a certain way and they got selected for something that tolerated the different climate better than the original had? Yep. So I think what you're referring to is that cultivar of Monarda fistulosa. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you know what, what? It's not so much a mutation. I mean, it, it, it's we're it's really evolution, right? So mm -hmm. when you when you think about a plant having a really broad range of uh, uh, a really broad natural range, um, you can pretty safely assume that the plants that are, you know, from the southeast uh, are different from the plants from the northeast. Um, and if, and, and in fact, you see this play out, you can bring, you know, let, let's say red maple, for example. If you bring uh, red maple from a more southern selection um, to New England, then its bloom time is going to be quite a bit different from the, the, you know, the red maple that's here in New England. And this is just what you're really seeing is the end result uh, or maybe the result in the middle of uh, evolution, right? And, and adaptation to particular uh, climates and to particular regions. Um, so if you're in New England and you bloom too early, um, then you never make any fruit and you never produce any seed and so you're naturally just selected out of the population. Uh, whereas if you bloom a little bit later, uh, you know, once the climate, once the temperature has warmed up enough for you to uh, produce fruit and produce seed, um, then your <coughs> progeny will survive and maybe they'll bloom even a little bit later than that. Um, so it's DNA. not, but no one's done any DNA no, analysis no. on it. So I, I understood what your question was. It's just, um, I, I haven't seen anyone doing any, uh, any r real DNA analysis on this, and that's sort of outside of my purview, and maybe something that Amy would know a little bit more about, uh, but definitely not, not something that I've seen. A PhD thesis for somebody else. Sure. Yeah, somebody else. <laughs> 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 there are some people doing research um, more with um, kind of some people at UVM that are studying um, chickpeas and sort of wild relatives of chickpeas, mm -hmm. but there's a, um, but chickpeas are a huge food source for a lot of the world, mm -hmm. and so um, there's, DNA studies are really, really expensive, and there's not a lot of money for um, curious gardeners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot more money if you're trying to sort of solve um, famine issues throughout right. the world. So I don't know of any um, sort of active DNA projects. Just sort of How about one more question? Do you have another uh, recommendation for ground cover to replace lawns with? Yeah, um, I mean wild strawberries, my best choice. Uh, dry shade, Carex Pennsylvanica, you can't go wrong with Carex Pennsylvanica. Uh, we're tinkering with a, a warm season grass called autumn bent grass, Agrostis perennis. Um, that seems to be a pretty, pretty good lawn alternative. Uh, it's one that you might need to mow a few times during the season. Um, Aragrostis that I mentioned before can make a decent lawn alternative. Um, there's, there's plenty, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a short list, but I, 
really is going to depend on site conditions. Yep. Uh, if you're looking for something that looks like a traditional lawn, then there's almost no better mm -hmm. alternative than Carex, Pennsylvania, <laughs> especially if it's a dry, shady site. Uh, if you don't really care if it's <coughs> if it looks like a traditional lawn, then I think wild strawberry is about the best that you'll, you'll find. Um, yeah, there's a few. Someone had a comment or a question on the uh, Well, I thought I had called about that. I have a lot of shade. Mm -hmm. And I thought the person said, no, no, you're not going to be able to do it. What, Carrick's, Pennsylvania? Yeah, no, it's it, definitely it shade. Likes the shade. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. it's, it's a, very happy it's a shady it's under understory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah Carrick's, Carrick's Pennsylvania in particular really likes, really likes yeah. the shade. It, it can tolerate some, but it's definitely happy as the shade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you.